My name is Anjani Conneru. I'm a pediatric dentist uh, practicing in Saskatoon. Uh, my specialty is um, providing dental care for children and adults with special needs. Unfortunately, dental caries in children is not uh, decreasing, it's increasing. We see uh, now that 61% of kids ages 6 and 12 in Saskatchewan have cavities and that is a lot worse than the statistics we had in 1993. Ah, you have beautiful teeth. And look straight up, honey, and go, ah, again. Our rate of dental pediatric surgeries in Saskatoon on average is about 40 to 50 uh, cases a week, and that number has not decreased. So the flashlight goes on. The prevalence of dental caries in the population hasn't decreased that much. What has changed over time is that the extent and severity of the destruction of teeth has changed. I think what we're seeing now is the serious disease, the extent and severity, early childhood dental disease, the, the most rampant form of it is um, focused in certain segments of the population that face access to care barriers. So if someone can't pay uh, to go and see the dentist or is separated from the dentist by a thousand kilometers or uh, is physically challenged that they can't get to the dentist, well, dental care generally doesn't come to them. So these are people at high risk for disease and these are, these are the, uh, the kids and, and adults who are uh, bearing the brunt of, of the disease. With dental anesthesia, we can't just put something uh, like an endotracheal tube that goes down into the windpipe. Um, we can't put that through the mouth because they're working in the mouth. So we have to put it through the nose. And sometimes that can be a little bit more difficult to place. It can cause a nosebleed. And so sometimes if it causes a nosebleed as we're putting it in, it makes it a little bit more difficult to see because we have to see the vocal cords and put the endotracheal tube between the vocal cords into the windpipe or trachea. For the anesthetic risk, um, you, can, you can divide them up into two different parts. There are the anesthetic risks that, um, for, of side effects, such as nausea and vomiting, specifically for dental, a nosebleed afterwards, dizziness, drowsiness, um, pain, you can see that sometimes they shiver, and these are sort of side effects of, of sort of expected things that can happen. And then there are the adverse effects, severe adverse effects. Now that can be extreme bronchospasm, again aspiration into the lungs, hypoxia, uh, hypotension, allergic reaction, anaphylaxis, and you know in the worst possible scenario, death. Our child is in the primary dentition. She has um, some interproximal or cavities between her teeth and also on the biting surfaces of the teeth. So on her right side, we've got some larger cavities. This is where the nerves uh, and blood supply runs in the pulp chamber and so they're getting a little bit close to the, to, um, the pulp. She does have um, early, uh, severe early childhood caries. She's, you know, she's only four years old, and so um, there's multiple teeth that have decay. So um, she would be classified as a severe case. So we know from the X-rays a lot of what we need to do, and then we'll also, um, to complete our diagnosis, do a clinical exam, and that's where we usually start. So we need a little mouth prop here. Just to... so we're just placing our throat pack. Okay, throat pack's in. And so, this is her upper right. We do have a large uh, occlusal cavity and two large interproximal cavities on her primary molars on the top right. Canine seems okay. And these are the front teeth, there's decay on the back of the front teeth as well as in between. On the bottom we also see that there's some cavities here on the second molar on the biting surface and from the x-ray we know that there's decay in between. We also have cavities in between her left central and lateral incisors 
and also on the biting surface here of our second molar on the top left. And on the bottom, we have some larger cavities on her primary molars. And her lower incisors are good. There's no decay. A little bit of wear, which is not unusual. The fact that so many children in Saskatchewan are going to the operating room, and, and let's look at this for a minute. They're going to the operating room. They're being put to sleep for their teeth. They're being put to sleep for something that is completely preventable. And something that is completely preventable in a fairly easy way. There's a risk of a child dying in the operating room. I mean, you go to the operating room for serious and significant things. But in Saskatchewan, if we look at children, the number one reason for kids going to the operating room is not for heart surgery, is not for other serious problems like motor vehicle accidents and broken bones, it's for their teeth. To me, that's a crime. That is, that is insane that, again, the most expensive way of treating people is being utilized. I mean, the OR is not the most efficient way to treat children, nor is it appropriate. I mean, this, in this day and age, kids should not be going to the operating room in the numbers that they are for dental treatment. It shows that there's a, a huge flaw in the system. There's a huge gap in people's knowledge and people's behaviors and the system's ability to effectively prevent this disease from occurring. It's a, it's a symptom of a completely messed up healthcare model, not just in Saskatchewan, in this country. So we're doing a procedure called a pulpotomy, which is essentially a partial root canal. It's just because the decay was uh, quite close to the pulp where the nerve and the blood supply runs and we don't want um, our tooth to abscess. So this is a way to keep this tooth hopefully till the child is 10. So baby teeth are important for a number of reasons. Children need them to function, to eat. They assist with development of the jaw. If they get decayed, you know, teeth are connected to the rest of the body. They have the same blood supply that goes to your heart, to your brain. And so if you were to get a dental abscess where, say, a cavity wasn't restored, the tooth has died, and now the tooth is abscessed, the, the bacteria um, and the inflammatory response it spread, can spread to the rest of the body. So we've had children, there's been reports of children developing brain abscesses because of untreated um, dental caries. Uh, it's important to look after them. We don't advocate leaving uh, cavities in children's teeth Yes, they will fall out, but in the meantime, your child could have pain. They could, um, you know, have difficulty eating with. It's, it's a quality of life issue as well. We can provide oral health education to people. And as a matter of fact, we know that the hardest thing to do is change behavior. So you can equip people with the knowledge, but whether they translate that knowledge into action, I think that's where the problem lies. You know, I think you can talk to most people in the population, ask them what causes uh, cavities, and they'll tell you in some way, shape, or form. They know that it has to do with not brushing properly, not eating a healthy diet, sugars, uh, and not seeking dental care. But for some reason, that knowledge has not been translated into action. And um, in certain segments of the population, uh, if someone is facing disparities in their socioeconomic status. I mean, if they have more things going on, like trying to um, worry about safe housing, um, they may not be thinking about their teeth. Right? Then if they are thinking about their teeth and good nutrition, 
If a nutritious diet costs significantly more in the north than it does in the south, there's a problem. It, it, it throws up another kind of barrier in front of somebody that challenges them to make a decision, well, what can I do or what do I want to do? I see what happens when children do have cavities. I see them with swollen faces. I see them not able to eat. Um, you know, and, and it's sad to me because I know it's mostly preventable and it's not the child's fault that they're in this situation. I really think we need to advocate for our kids that they deserve to have healthy mouths. It's like a right. They shouldn't have to suffer from something that could have been prevented. Oral health is important in and of itself, but it's doubly important because it has an effect on your systemic health. You cannot be healthy without good oral health. And the fact is that non-dentists, non-oral health care providers, docs, nurses, they see people earlier in life and more frequently in life. So you have an active role to play in incorporating oral health into your practice, no matter what your practice of health care is. And that's what we have to do. Dentistry and oral health care folks can't do this alone. We need to engage all of health care to participate then maybe we can make a difference.